Good morning and a very warm welcome to everybody joining us today from around the, the, around the region from Egypt to Dubai for today's webinar, Gender in the Workplace and Crucial Conversations for Men, where we will explore what it takes for men to build a new narrative in the workplace with a focus on gender equity so that we can create a more inclusive workplace for all. On behalf of the American University of Cairo, Egypt Women on Boards Observatory, Ashridge Executive Education, and the 30% Club MENA, I'd like to thank you for joining us for this very crucial conversation. I would also like to thank our hosts for organizing today's webinar, the Egypt Women on Boards Observatory, who are also members of the 30% Club MENA, and today they've joined efforts with the Holt Ashridge Executive Education and 30% Club MENA as part of their commitment to leading ongoing dialogue and collaboration with key ecosystem partners and stakeholders to drive and scale collective impact for gender equality and inclusion. The Egypt Women on Boards Observatory advocates for the presence of 30% women on boards in Egypt by 2030. And through their collaboration with numerous stakeholders offering unique value-added impact, bringing together government, business associations, research institutions, international organizations, and non-government organizations. This remarkable collaboration between the entities has resulted in a broad coverage of the major business sectors where women have presence on boards, as well as providing substantial information for research and building a database of expert women seeking board positions. Ashridge Executive Education, our partners today, are based in the UK. They are the Executive Education Campus of Holt International Business School. Ashridge provides transformational learning and development experiences for leaders and businesses worldwide, underpinned by robust research. It also supports organizations as they work to establish gender balance and diversity across the workforce and to leverage the benefits that diversity brings. And the 30% Club is a global campaign led by chairs and CEOs taking action to increase gender diversity at board and senior management levels. The campaign continues to expand its international footprint with presence in multiple countries and regions around the world. Our global mission is to achieve at least 30% representation of all women on all boards and C-suites globally. We support gender diversity in its very broadest sense Ethnicity, disability, socioeconomic background are all part of the journey. We believe that only those organizations that foster truly inclusive cultures, cultures that embrace women who look, act, and importantly, think differently, can reach their full potential to positively impact their people, their markets, and their communities. My name is Lordi Lahto, and I'm delighted to be co-moderating today's webinar. I'm currently the CEO of Companies Creating Change, C3, and a member of the 30% Club MENA Core Steering Committee, leading the Women on Boards initiative. I'm also an advisor to TARA, an organization powering connections between female university students and corporates via speed mentoring and access to role models. My corporate career spans over two decades of international business experience, working in many countries in senior corporate leadership roles focused on business growth strategy. Joining me in moderating today's session are two subject matter experts, Dr. Rada and Dr. Debbie. The bios of our esteemed speakers and panelists this morning are full of incredible accomplishments. And in, in the interest of time, I will not go through all of these. The goal of today is to listen, to learn and leverage from their experience and their journeys. 
Dr. Rada Hawedi is the Associate Dean for Executive Education at the American University in Cairo School of Business. Dr. Rada is the founder of Egypt Women on Boards Observatory. She has extensive experience in organizational change and strategic management in local, regional, and international organizations in the areas of higher education, human rights, management development, information technology, and export promotion. Dr. Rada is also a certified board director and a certified corporate governance trainer for SMEs and women in business by the IFC. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Debbie bainton Lees. Dr. Debbie is a professor of leadership and organizational development research fellow at the Ashridge Executive Education Holt International Business School. Dr. Debbie is an experienced leadership and organizational development consultant and researcher. She has a special interest in the strategic and systemic development of gender balance, strengthening women's leadership and leveraging the benefits of diversity in organizations through inclusion. Her doctoral thesis explores the phenomena of women being socially silenced in everyday conversational life. She is passionate about working with forward thinking organizations to achieve cultures of equity and belonging where inclusive conversations and ways of working are the norm. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Rada and Dr. Debbie. And now I would like to introduce our speakers. We are honored to have a panel of male experts of business leaders. Welcome Dr. Nick Waith, Chief Executive Officer at the Energy Institute. Dr. Nick has 22 years of experience in executive and manage managerial roles. And most recently, he was the Chief Development Officer of Alternative Energy at BP. Prior to this, he held senior roles as VP of Competitor Intelligence and as Head of North America Investor Relations. He's also a board member for Powerful Women. I'd like to welcome Hisham Farooq, CEO of Grant Thornton, UAE. Hisham is well known for leading high profile advisory engagements for some of the largest international conglomerates and local groups mainly across the financial, hospitality, real estate, construction, aviation, FMCG, SMEs, and family business sectors. He is recognized as one of the top three leaders in the accounting profession within the MENA region, making him a key member across Grant Thornton's presence in the Middle East. Hisham believes in and is an advocate of the importance of gender diversity as well as developing and empowering female leaders, particularly in the Middle East. And I must say that he's one of the most humble leaders and mentors that I personally know. Welcome, Hisham. And last but not least, I'd like to welcome Dr. Patrick Coffey, Deputy Head of Research, Global Investment Bank at a leading global bank. He, in his role, he's responsible for managing 18 sector teams, as well as having the joint responsibility for department culture, research product, platform, and clients. Prior to moving into research management, Patrick worked as an equity research analyst for 10 years in the leisure sector. In his early career, he was a business analyst for Manchester United Football Club and a strategy consultant. Patrick is a dedicated, to creating a diverse workforce and a culture of kindness and inclusion. He is the well being representative for the global research department. And now I'd like to hand over to Dr. Rada for framing the context of today's discussion. Thank you very much, Laudi, and welcome to all our participants. And I'm delighted to be among a very distinguished group of panelists and moderators. Just to, to frame what we're trying to do today, 
we we know in our own organizations how more women are reaching decision making positions should we assume that organizations will remain the same as they strive to gender equity we're asking the question of how organizations will actually change we're also thinking about should we assume that the culture of the organization will change when we exchange one gender for another at the top are we only exchanging the 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 person at the at the helm of the organization or will this impact our daily uh, experience in each of our organizations um our our striving uh, goal as uh, uh, advocates of gender equality is to create inclusive organizations for everyone so what does that actually mean for both men and women debbie and i have conducted research on um, women's issues gender issues and so on and i think we have a language to describe the experience of women I'm not sure we have the language to describe the experience of men in this transformational period and that's what we're looking for now. So how can a gender balanced organization be inclusive for everyone and where everyone belongs? How does this impact men who lose privilege? When we're talking about senior positions, we're talking about a limited number of positions. So by putting women in senior positions, men are going to be excluded. So when, when men are disenfranchised in this transformational process, what does this mean to them? How can we change that narrative? We don't have the answers to these questions, but we are raising them to explore with um, feminist men who have figured it out, like our speakers today. This is why we invited carefully selected three men who we think have figured it out, have, have created a narrative for themselves, are thinking about the same questions to see how they did it and to see how it impacted um, sort of the, their daily experience. So, so this is my take on why we're here today and I turn to Debbie to add her uh, inputs. Debbie, you're muted. Thank you, Garda, and hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be here today to have this really important conversation. We know that legislation officially gives women equal opportunity and rights in society, but we know all from recent research that the dial is still not shifting fast enough. Progress is being made to appoint women in senior positions, but we're quite disappointed with the level of progress, not just in um, the Middle East, but um, across the board. But so it's critical to have the right inclusive culture. We know that um, to address inclusion at organizational level, you have to have a systematic business led approach and bold action on inclusion. And that means involving men. It can't all be done by women. And so we're really excited to hear from the three men on our panel today, how they've in their organizations, what they've achieved and, and maybe some of the challenges they faced personally. So we want to really get to the thinking processes and the mindset um, that's required and how they've made their shifts. So without further ado, I'm going to hand back to Garda to um, start our questions. Thank you, Debbie. So, um, Nick, I'll, I'll start with you. Can you give us an idea about your thinking about gender equity, how you got there, your personal journey? Yeah, Garda, well, thank you. And, and thank you to the American University of Cairo and Ashridge Holt for hosting this wonderful event and, of course, the 30% Club. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't claim to have got there, Garda. I think that would be rather arrogant. And I would say I'm relatively new, actually, to this journey. I think, to me, the 
sort of watershed moment is the recognition that this is not about not being sexist. It's a bit like many of us around race sort of didn't really tune into our role of being anti-racist rather than just not being racist. And I think the same is true of gender. I think that realization that it's not just about um, you know, doing the right thing, engaging, it's about proactively making a difference. And so for me, some of the big changes I would say happened over the last five years at my former career in, in BP. Um, and I'll, I'll cite a couple of examples. I, I think I worked in a you know traditionally very male industry. Energy is still incredibly male um, at, at all levels, but particularly senior levels. And I, and I think there was a there is still a mindset that there is a limited talent pool of females in the mix. And I think it really isn't only until you begin to make some choices about how you show up as a male leader that you can begin to affect that. So, for example. Uh, a candidate slate for a, a job posting where you're given a list of, of all male candidates. I mean, that is something that you have to respond to and, and, you know, go look harder, go search. There must be females who have got this. Think about how the, the title is crafted. You know, in, in an energy role, we often demand prior experience of working in energy. Is that actually required for the, the nature of the role? And, and changing the language, um, thinking more laterally, can make a big difference actively uh, encouraging females to apply for roles. Um, how many men have been on all male panels and not, not even realized it, um, or at least not until we're sitting on a stage surrounded by other men. And so actually actively saying, no, um, I'd love to have joined that panel, but I've, you know, it's all men, I'm not gonna to add to that equally. Uh, when looking for one's own opportunities, be it uh, an executive role or a board role, um, I have actively turned down opportunities because I've looked at a board of a company and it's all male. And I think in 2021, if a company hasn't made some movement, it, it probably isn't the sort of place I, I want to work or be seen to be working. So I think some of those are the shifts I have made personally over the last few years. Um, if I'm honest, Garda, I, I think I was late to recognizing some of these things. I suspect a lot of men are would consider themselves, you know, pro-female, um, supportive of females. But actually, it's when you take these positive actions that I think you can begin to affect some change in the workplace. Thank, thank you very much, Nick. And it's actually the ability to articulate why you're doing things. I think this is also a huge contribution. So thank you very much for doing that. Uh, Hisham, I will now turn to you. And if you can give us an idea about your thinking about gender equity and your journey, your personal journey. Thank you, Hedda, and thank you to everyone. I'm very happy to be back here. I mean, AUC was my educational home, so uh, lovely to be back here with everyone. Um, honestly, my, my journey began um, quite some time back. I mean, I was I had the privilege to lead Grant Thornton in 2012. And when I looked at our organization, you know, we're an accounting practice, so it's very male dominant. Um, and yet, actually, all the education I learned, uh, I'm originally a sociology major. And, you know, you look at all societies historically, and, and most societies actually prospered under f feminine rule. Um, if you look at matriarchal societies today, you find that their culture, their empathy, uh, the level of, of even uh, like, like theft and security is, is, is far better than many other societies. So that triggered for me an, an idea to say that, you know, not only do we need to kind of change our own profession and, and, and have it much more inclusive, but actually that there is good, uh, which has been proven by time and community um, in having a much more inclusive uh, group of professionals working together. Um, so we started our journey back then. I remember we may have had two, three, maybe 5% of our population were women. Um, and usually they were more in the administrative role. So the first thing we did was we started looking at our policies um, and we started looking at, at, at the reasoning. And, and of course, the number of reasons were number one, um, you know, this is very similar to what Nick was saying, the opportunities given for let's say, the, uh, like sponsoring their education for their professional education. Um, you know, was, was more given to, to, to men, given this a male dominant profession. Um, two, obviously, once they came into the, the, the professional line, um, you know, naturally, if they want to build a family or so on, they get kind of delayed. These are all situations we know, but we said, how do we build and change our policies very early on for that? 
Um, and that helped in the beginning. It brought in more and more women. But we also then realized that, you know, there's an unconscious bias that's in place as well. Um, and, and so we started actually training our people against that unconscious bias um, from points like, you know, in interviews um, and how to communicate to points on, you know, just having an understanding of, of, of what it means to be, for example, a, you know, a mother um, and, and the challenges that a mother would have. And, and yes, we may say that, you know, that, that, that alone is biased to say that a mother has different challenges than a father. Uh, but, you know, a mother that has a young nursing child is, 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 has different requirements. So, so I think we, we need to change the narrative and how do we speak internally to our people and our team. Um, and it was a long journey. I mean, we've been at this and, and, and again, very similar to what Nick said, this journey I don't think will, will ever end. Uh, but I am proud to say now we're, we're about 40% women, 25% uh, in leadership. Um, and when we, we do our annual surveys, I mean, what we realize is that the women now are speaking up. They want more women. Um, and they want more women so that they can be heard and, and, and feel kind of they, they have that stronger presence. Um, and I think once we get to that equilibrium, um, things will change. Um, and, and yes, I'm, I'm, I'm a firm believer that if you look at our firm today, um, you know, honestly, it's a lot more enjoyable. Uh, you know, people are a lot more lighthearted. Um, you know, that sense of, 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 you know, you know, sense of, you know, we are professionals, but we don't have to carry that professional badge, you know, from nine to five. We can be human beings as well. Um, and I think that, that bringing back that humanity with inclusiveness was, was really core to what we did and why we're doing it. Thank you very, very much, Hashem. And I, I think there's the, the importance of your own interdisciplinary education in the beginning allowed you to see things differently as well. That's, that's a very important point. So sponsoring professional development and accommodating the mid-career leaking pipe, this is incredibly important. So thank you very much for this. Patrick, now I turn to you. Um, your thinking about gender uh, equity and your personal journey, please. Yeah, sure. Um, and thanks again, uh, everyone, for being here. I think it's a very important event. Um, so I guess, first of all, echoing uh, the words of um, the others on this call, Nick and Hisham, I think that for me, it's been a very much an involved journey. And I, I certainly don't think I'm anywhere near the end of that. Um, and I don't think I ever will be. Um, and it's really um, that journey has has effectively followed my maturity in the workplace. Then I moved into um, my current role, which is a manager managerial role. And I suppose all of the learnings that I had seen before were slowly evolving in my uh, relatively small brain. And I was trying to think about how we could create a better culture in our department. And I think that culture is completely key. Um, understanding the benefits of diversity across all, all levels, whether gender, you know, race, sexuality, other, um, is, is so important. But trying to get the culture right and at least attempt to improve it, frankly, can save a company a lot of money because you can reduce churn, you can improve um, employee satisfaction and, uh, and ultimately their well-being and therefore productivity. So um, I moved into the managerial role um, and I can talk a bit about it later on, I'm sure, when we talk about promotions, when we talk about yeah. um, interview panels, when we talk about everything yeah. else. Yeah. Um, but alongside all of that, I think I was reading and watching things, whether it was the Billie Jean King documentary on Battle of the Sexes, which I thought was great, um, whether it was a documentary about Serena Williams, who I think is probably the most um, underappreciated global sports star, probably because of her sex. In the way she's perceived, um, or whether it's Invisible Woman recently, or um, Ngoze's Feminist Manifesto and 15 Suggestions. These books and these, these things I was watching were helping me on that journey. So um, I'll be quiet there. Um, I, guess, I guess my kind of key point would be that what I've learned on that journey is being conscious of the workplace you're in, being conscious of the practices and processes that go into building that workplace, and being open-minded to change, and quite frankly, being open-minded to radical change is probably the best thing you can do. Thank you very much, Patrick. And, and what's coming across very clearly to me as you're speaking is that you're someone who's recognized that the value of fairness is important to you and you're trying to live by it. So it's actually being in touch with our core values and trying to live by that in our workplace. So, so that's wonderful. Thank you very, very much. And thank you to the three speakers.
in this first round of questions. And I now turn to Debbie for the second round of questions. Okay, so um, what would be really important for us now is if you would um, share some of the conversations that you've had that have helped you to create your um, shifts in mindset. I mean, we've heard some things from Patrick um, about, you know, how we can watch films, um, read important books, which all obviously help to shift our mindset. But what are, the, what are the key conversations you've had, maybe with some colleagues or other people that have helped you to shift your mindset? So let's, let's start with um, Hisham this time. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Debbie. Actually, one of, one of the very interesting uh, projects we did, and, and again, Grand Fronting Global is, you know, diversity and inclusion is very high on its agenda. Um, so we had a senior leadership program, and I remember they brought us all in um, this was a couple of years back. And, and again, you know, the, the group of us, it was both men and women, uh, but they brought in a psychologist that actually their intention was, was to show vulnerability. Um, and it was very interesting to see because, because a lot of the men in the room um, had, had, you know, difficulty showing the vulnerability for, for, for reasons that they were conditioned to show, you know, you know, their sense of responsibility and present professionalism, you know, on stage. Um, and women also equally had, had you know, um, difficulty showing vulnerability because I felt they, they were conditioned that they needed to, to prove that they even had, you know, thicker um, skin to, to be able to, to be in there. And as we, after we finished and, and after a lot of tissue paper and, and tears, um, it was fascinating how, how the communication completely changed at dinner that night um, because we just realized we're all vulnerable um, and we all have weaknesses. Um, and I think that was for me just an, an amazing breakthrough um, on how I think teams can come together and, and, and use that as a unified approach. Um, again, tapping into our humanity more than just looking at it from a gender perspective. Yes, thank, thank you. And, and from what you said earlier about um, when there are more women in the group, in the team, um, I think that you, men are able to be more vulnerable with each other. And um, that goes a long way to reducing bias. It's about getting to know each other on a human level. And, um, you know, it's an important part of the journey. Thank you. Okay, Nick, we'll go to you next. I'll, I'll cite a, a few examples. I mean, I think the first experience I would share is that sometimes this conversation can feel a bit scary as a man, certainly for me. Yeah. On the outside of this conversation some time ago, um, it felt like a scary place to come into. Um, and, and my experience, I'm glad to say, is that it isn't scary. Um, it's not anti-men. Um, I joined the Board of Powerful Women about six months ago. Um, and, and that group, that board has deliberately set itself up to be broadly female, male. Um, there's a slight balance towards female. But that group has deliberately embraced males into the conversation. I mean, clearly, um, males are the problem. Uh, if we think about there's nobody else we can really point the finger at on this. And, and therefore, males need to be certainly a, a reasonable part, if not a big part of the solution. So, that, so I think just the realization that this, this whole conversation is not anti-men. Um, it's nice to see some men on the call today. Thank you for joining. It would be great if we had more men coming to conversations like this to understand their role. I think, Garda, you, talk, you used the term loss of privilege as well at the start. Um, and I guess to some men, maybe to many men, it may feel like that. I think that's a conversation where you need to flip it around. You know, the, the companies, the organizations that are going to be successful in the future are going to be the ones that have um, organizations, leadership teams, boards that are made up of a true representation of society. And therefore, it drives competitive advantage. I heard the CEO of a very large UK energy company actually hoping other companies didn't embrace this agenda in the way that his company had because he, he genuinely believed it gave him competitive advantage. Now, he didn't really mean that clearly. We want all companies to embrace that, but there is a point of competitive advantage. And I think once men realize that um, and play into that, you know, I don't think it's a loss of privilege. It's a gain of opportunity. And then I think, I mean, the, the last conversations which have affected me are, are the hard conversations when, you know, I, I have been the man 
making excuses as to why there aren't any females in the candidate slate or why we haven't got a female interview in a, in a, a recruitment process. And when somebody in HR has said, Nick, you need to try harder. Um, those are the conversations where you step back, think, OK, yep, you're right. I need to do something differently here. Um, and I think as, as well as having those conversations with people, we need to be ready to receive those conversations um, as we go through our day to day lives. Thank you, Nick. And yes, the, I think the, um, the sense that men feel that they are part of the problem is one of the things that's stopping men from becoming engaged in this conversation a lot of the time. And, and we've got to find some ways to get over that um, and, you know, help them to see that without them, we can't do it. So we've got, the, we've got to work together to be part of the solution, be the solution. Thank you. Patrick. How about you? What kind of conversations have helped you to have a change in mindset, shift your thinking? Yeah, it's, it's a difficult question. And I'm afraid I don't have a great answer for this because there were no specific conversations. With, you know, there, there were no light bulb moments for me. And I think it goes back to the first question uh, that Garda asked around my understanding of it all. I think it's a, an evolving um, kind of maturity, frankly, on my behalf. So I can't point to one specific thing. What I can say is that um, it's, more, it's all about observing behavior and listening in the workplace. So behavioral things that one, one can observe, and I suspect almost everyone on this call will have seen some of these things, but um, microaggressions in terms of um, words that can be used to describe um, females that wouldn't be used to describe men. Um, and Debbie, you're the expert in this area, but you know there were there were there were countless number of those that I observe on a on a you know I used to observe a lot, and we tried our very best to cut that out in our department um, pretty aggressively. Um, whether it's interrupting uh, women, and I think that that's something that uh, has actually been a real challenge during the pandemic, particularly on Zoom calls like this. Um, there was a propensity, I think, for men, when you start thinking about these things a bit more and become a bit more conscious of them, you can observe them a lot more. Your job as a leader, I think, or your job, frankly, as anyone in the department, is to call it out. Um, and then other, you know, another thing, and, and, I, and I, won't, I won't list out all the examples, but another thing is, you go into a meeting for half an hour and the first 10 minutes is talk to, talking about the Spurs versus Arsenal results or the Man United, whatever. And quite frankly, this isn't to suggest that women don't like football, but quite frankly, quite a lot of people in that room don't really care about Spurs or Arsenal. So you've got to cut that out um, because you, you can create an all boys club quite quickly, I think. Um, so those are just three examples, but then, you know, you can talk about how, uh, women can get referred to as girls and men get referred to as men and again it's uh it's, it's trying to change that behavior and, and, and challenging yourself so other conversations for me conversations with my wife uh who was very successful at work um she's now full-time mother um but you know she's always my sounding board um and will uh will help me out a lot um i listen to and debate a lot with an expert in the area of gender equality in the workplace um, not in a formal way, but during um, dinner time conversations and, and other situations, social situations, and I learn a huge amount from her. Uh, I have a female career coach who's helped me a huge amount um, as well. So it's all of those things. And then, and then the final thing I'd say is about, again, on the, on the listening piece, but it's around feedback on what has gone well. So whether that's clarity around pay, and I can talk about that in a moment, promotional clarity for all um, men and women, and, um, and, and thinking about work-life balance, particularly post-pandemic, uh, is critical. So learning and listening to people on those sorts of topics, but I guess we'll touch on them next. Um, anyway, so that's probably all for me on that. I've probably gone over my two minutes again, so apologies. Thank you, Patrick. There's some great insights there. And, I, and just going back to your point about uh, microaggressions and uh, inclusive conversation in the workplace, and particularly virtually, um, we're really um, working hard with leaders at the moment um, to develop the skills to make those interventions when they notice microaggressions or bias. And interestingly, um, the, the whole um, experience is full of challenges for people. 
Um, so again, that's an area that we've really got to work on. We're just going to have a quick poll now with our audience and ask you, what, have you had conversations about gender in your workplace? So if we could have the poll put up, thank you. You could put your, your answers in there. Um, we can see who's had conversations and everyone so far is saying yes. We've got four responses so far. Any more? Okay, we'll leave it at that. So far, four people have had conversations about gender in the workplace. So I don't, because there's only four responses, I don't know if that means the rest of you haven't. Um, but that that's interesting. Ah, apparently someone says the poll has got an error. Not to worry. Okay, so um, I'm going to hand over now to Lordy, who um, is going to explore our third question. Thank you, Debbie. So I'd now like to address the question to our panelists and ask them to share their personal or main organizational achievements with respect to gender equity. And at the same time, um, what advice would you give to other men embarking on this journey? And I will uh, start with Hisham. All right, thank you, Lodi, I appreciate it. Um, look, I think, I think that the main thing is, is and, and I know my, my colleagues have touched on many points, um, the, the conversation has to stay open. Um, I think that's the most important thing. And, and, the, and the conversation will evolve. You know, um, I think coming into a room and saying, this is, you know, these are the policies we're going to change and, and that's about it. Everyone will always learn something new um, as this kind of, you know, professional community comes together. So I think that's that's one of the main things. And I think the other thing is, is you know, um, something that Dr. Red alluded to earlier was, was you, know, you know, while some men may see this as taking away their opportunities, as we see, um, you know, many, uh, many regulated entities stating that there has to be a minimum number, for example, of women on the board. Um, and, and so some men may see this as, as a deprivation of their rights. I think that that, that, that that conversation between the men that work together has to happen as well. Um, and an understanding and a debate and an openness on, on, on letting go of why they're holding on to this and, you know, and ensuring as well that, that there is, for example, then a process of, of, of cycles. You know, so maybe you have shorter cycles that allows more people to come in. Um, so, so that's where I think the dialogue must stay open and, and, and people need to be uh, ready to be able to have these discussions. Um, but I guess, I guess progression will naturally happen um, and it should be embraced, you know, in, in a good way. Thank you, Hisham. And um, Nick, what are your thoughts and uh, what would you like to share with us? So a few thoughts. I mean, firstly, in my own organisation, the Energy Institute, um, I have, I've only been there for six months, so I've had the benefit of inheriting a very um, balanced organisation. In fact, a majority of females at all levels, including the leadership team, um, which is a fantastic place to be and, and something I will do everything I can to, to maintain and, and to continue to build upon. If, if I think about more broadly the energy industry um, and, and my role at Power for Women, I mean, today, um, nearly 30% of the top UK uh, energy companies, uh, the top 80, um, do not have a single female on their board. I mean, that's a staggering statistic. How can that be in 2021 that 30% of those companies don't have a single female. The, the numbers that executive management are, are, are not anything to um, show off about either. So I, I, I think we need to change the mindset. Um, you know, organizations like the 30% club, I, I really think you need to rebrand as the 50% club because until we get to 50%, um, we're, we're not delivering um, what we need to in terms of representing society. And I think this is absolutely critical at the, at the moment um, on the back of COP26, net zero energy transition is front page news everywhere. 
And the reality is, is I don't think that transition can be delivered without an industry that represents society in every form of, of diversity. Um, energy companies need to represent and understand the customers whom they're serving. And I think that's absolutely critical. I think the other thing I'd like to touch on briefly is the role of men in childcare. And Hisham, you talked about this a minute ago about you know how, and I've heard this many times, we need to do more to support working mothers. And absolutely, um, we do need to do a lot more to support working mothers. I also believe passionately, we need to do more to support working fathers and to make this less of a gender sort of perceived role. And I think as I, you know, in terms of the, the benefits in terms, there are very few organizations that offer sort of equal paternity maternity rights. I think there's a mindset shift. We need to have a society and as business and as organizations that doesn't see females as the primary caregivers. Um, it, it, it needs to be balanced. It needs to, you know, encourage men. Um, when I, in my previous role at BP, I set up a working parent and carers group, which I chaired. Um, and interestingly, that, that group had as many engaged men um, as part of it trying to make a difference as we had engaged um, working mothers. So I think there's a really important role we have to sort of, you know, let um, each couple um, decide what suits their family circumstances and, and really try and take the gender out of um, you know, primary caregiving. Um, I think that's really important. Thank you very much for those insights. And um, Patrick, we'd like to hear from you, um, you know, what sort of accomplishments or uh, main achievements that you have been able to deliver and um, please some advice to other men in the room today um, that are embarking on this journey. It's, it's an incredibly important point. And I think, uh, you know, anyone in the department um, should be aware of shared paternity leave. Um, and if you don't know about that, you should, um, promote it certainly and I think that's just very very important um so I, I've listed down a bunch of things here I'm going to rattle through them um and uh, I won't give a huge amount of detail on them but just a few things um in terms of achievements and it's not to say we've got everything right a lot of it's experimental and a lot of it is taking a risk and sometimes you get things drastically wrong um so recruitment um I think it's really really important um we, we use headhunters and we do internal recruitment. Headhunters can very often bring you um, five fantastic and incredible candidates and they're all men and very often they're all white men. Again, you have to challenge them and accept that things will take longer. You've got to challenge them. Setting up um, a promotions committee with an equality on that of at least 50% uh, male, female is something that we've done. Um, having ex officios um, onto um, global committees is also very, very important. Um, I'll just whiz through a few more things, but um, you know, creating uh, working groups, um, so diversity committees is something we've done uh, relatively recently. Importantly, management shouldn't be involved in those committee conversations. They should step out and let the committee talk about it and come and present to them with ideas for change. Um, we talked a bit about childcare, work-life balance and considering changing things like start times or, you know, from a leadership perspective, talking about your own childcare challenges and your own start times and how you've, um, you've changed post-pandemic. Um, be aware of the networks in your business, whether it's a women's network, whether it's a diversity network, whether it's the female lead network that's been set up. Be aware of those networks within a wide organization and talk to people about it and promote those networks. Um, a few other things, just briefly, um, when presenting to departments or externally, um, think about who it is presenting. Why not, um, why not challenge that kind of, the two men that stand up there and, um, and have some diversity on internal and external presentations. Um, and then finally, in terms of other things, promotional, um, promoting, you know, reading lists or films that I referenced earlier to the department, it doesn't cost a lot to buy a bunch of books and hand them out to everyone, like Invisible Woman, which is something we did last year. Um, so that's about it in terms of ideas, but I guess you asked about, um, yeah, that, that's about it. I've gone over time again, sorry.
No, thank you very much for sharing um, those examples. I'm sure relevant to everybody. And it's interesting how um, we've all touched or you've all touched on similar themes, particularly around the conversation having to stay open as Hisham has said, and you've all um, said similar points and the conversation will evolve. So thank you. I'll hand over to, to Rada. Thank you, Laudi. I, I think we have another poll now about the, the webinar. And apologies if the first poll didn't work uh, properly. Maybe I think we have time to do the two polls together. So can we repeat the first poll again, please? Aya? Okay, this is the second poll now uh, we're doing. I will do the first poll again, but uh, just After. give me one minute. Okay, okay so we're doing this one now and we're getting people to participate. Okay. Good, we'll leave it on for a, a little more time. Okay. Good. So we'll, we'll leave it on for another five, six seconds. Okay, so we've ended the first poll, uh, Aya. You will show us the uh, results. I now, have please? to repeat it again. So, okay. We, we, which one are you repeating? The 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 one about how the webinar helped. Okay. No, I so will, I will repeat the first one, the first poll. Okay, just a second. After so this so, one. thank you, thank you. So, uh, we have about ninety two percent of participants saying that they think that the webinar uh, helped. Uh, they're thinking about gender in the workplace. So thank you for that. And we apologize to the two that didn't benefit. And, and we hope to hear from you, your uh, concerns and how we can make it better and more relevant for you. Thank you, Aya. So we'll go back to the first poll now. And if anyone's got any questions, please um, write them in right. and we can address exactly. them. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Okay, so this is the first poll again. We're repeating it uh, for those who were not able to uh, respond the first time. Okay, so we're getting about almost 80% of participants have had actually conversations about gender in the workplace. That's, uh, that's quite significant. So I think now everyone has had a chance to respond to this poll. Thank you. Thank you, Aya. Okay, so we will close this now. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Aya. Um, so just to, to conclude and to wrap, I, I, for, for me, this has been a very, very exciting conversation and, and I really want yeah. to thank um, our speakers. Uh, this uh, webinar is recorded and we will share it with everyone who participated. And I encourage you to share it with your colleagues um, who may be interested to learn from it. I will definitely do that in my networks because I think there were very important insights and we need to encourage men to join the conversation. So 
the things that that stood out for me i've been taking a lot of notes as as patrick and nick and hisham were talking but um uh, not not enough to be not sexist or racist but you have to be actively anti-sexist and racist that that really stood out for me uh, sponsoring the professional development of women and accommodating uh, mid-career leaking um, pipes and having uh, activities to show vulnerability um, being aware of micro ag aggressions and hiring practices and living by your values i mean th these are all very very important things to be able to articulate and and bring out so debbie and i are, are working on some research in this area and together with the 30% Club Mina, we will be organizing a workshop uh, on the 1st of February around creating gender equality allies and partners. So this is a heads up for the workshop. Um, we hope that you will all be able to participate and uh, we hope that we will be able to engage with you and other colleagues um, who would like to be part of this conversation. Um, I see um, a comment um, in, I'm looking for the questions in the- Question, uh, there's a question. Yes, from Rihal, um, I, would, I would, yeah. yes. I would like to ask why men think that once there is equality in the workplace to hire women, this means our opportunities are taken from them. Um, I, I think I, I mentioned that a little bit when, when in my opening points, not about the hiring of women generally in the organization, but about the positions on the top. So if we're talking about a board that only has nine members and these nine members are currently men, in order to put a woman on the board, one of the men will lose his position. Uh, you can only have one CEO in a company. So if currently you have a majority of male CEOs, to have a woman CEO, that CEO will lose privilege. That's the point that I was making from the personal perspective of the men. But I'd like to hear if Nick, Patrick, and Hisham, you have any responses to this question. Well, I'll have a go if I may, Garda. I mean, I, I think there's a perception this is a zero-sum game. And, and, and you know, if you look at one company in isolation, then arguably it is. But if you think about the, you know, the, the potential of planet Earth and having 50% of the population fully engaged in, in every aspect of, of the workforce, that has got to make a bigger hole for everybody to play in. Um, and I genuinely believe, as I mentioned before, the companies, the organizations that do have the right um, level of diversity across all dimensions are going to grow. They're going to become bigger. It creates more opportunity. And so, you know, I genuinely believe the men that, that lean into this will, will find competitive advantage for their organizations and, and frankly, for themselves personally. And I, and I think we've got to break away from this being felt like a zero sum game. It really isn't. Um, so I, I, I would, I, I get why people make, make that point at a sort of micro level, at a macro level. I think we need to have a different mindset. Thank I, you, Nick. I doubt I can be as eloquent as Nick, but the only thing I'd add is, um, I think being aware of the, all of the academic data around the, the benefits of diversity. So instead of thinking about it in terms of um, me versus them, think about it in terms of improving the workplace and improving, you know, society as a whole, quite frankly. And, you know, therefore, if you think about the data, you use the data, you will want to create and promote a diverse workforce. And that will at times mean that men don't get jobs, but that's the right thing for the workplace. And that's the right thing for creating a really inclusive, good culture. Exactly. And there are huge benefits to companies when, when that's the, uh, and that's put in place. So I think I think being aware of the data is really important. And I think one of the panelists referenced that earlier, thinking about the data around um, each cohort, male, female, and think about diversity. Not so one can talk about this stuff endlessly, but if you don't look at the data and challenge the data and try and improve it, you're not going to make a lot of progress. Absolutely, absolutely. 
Hisham, any final comments? We're out of time, but I'll give you 30 seconds. <laughs> Thank you very much. No, the, the quickest thing is just that this is a message actually to all the men is, is actually observe um, how you are around women in the workplace and when you're not. Um, and I think that alone will tell you what needs to change. Uh, but thank you. Thank you, doctor. Thank you very much. Very, very, very succinct and very, very, uh, uh, I have to say, uh, uh, eloquent, uh, eloquent <laughs> and important. So there was a question about when the recording will be ready early next week. It will be sent to all participants and we will be sharing it on our uh, social media, both uh, AUC, uh, HALT, and 30% uh, Club MENA. So, um, yeah, the early next week, I think everyone should get it. So I want to thank very, very much our speakers, Patrick Kofi, Hisham Farouk, Nick Waif. I want to thank Laudi and Debbie for working with us on this. And I want to thank all the AUC team behind the scene who made this happen. Uh, Sally, Shireen, Aya, uh, thank you all for organizing this. Thank you all to, uh, also to uh, all our audience. And we hope to see you in the workshop on the 1st of February and to encourage your male colleagues to join. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Doctor. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.